Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Nicole Horry. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll review the most recent top five Think Tech talk shows and the staff pick. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the public issues and guests involved. Think Tech produces some 30 talk shows every week in our downtown studio. Here's a list of all our incredible Think Tech shows and hosts. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before based on the number of views each of them has had on the internet. For this past week, the winning shows were as follows. Number one, from the series Hawaii Together, it's called The Future of Waianae, hosted by Kaylee Akina with guest Jermaine Myers, Native Hawaiian community leader. It's on our Hawaii Together playlist. I think that a lot of people, when they think of the Waianae Coast, especially parts that are densely populated with Native Hawaiians, and by the way, the Waianae Coast is the most concentrated and densely populated Native Hawaiian population in the world, a lot of times, people have a great many misconceptions. Yes. And part of the reason is they've just not been out there. And part of the reason is that as Y&I has changed with some of the challenges it faces, it gets a bad rap often. You know, what, what are some of those misconceptions that you come across and, and what's the truth? Well, there's a lot of misconceptions. Some of them are true that there were some types of crime, but crime is everywhere. Um, of course, there's drug issues and drug issues are everywhere, even on the other, Kauai Kai and Kane Ohe. Um, you know, I feel the most safest when I'm at home in Nanakuli and all along the West Coast. I have never felt unsafe. Um, so there's a misconception that every person that you meet, there's a lot of general statements that everyone or people that you meet at the beach or in the stores, you know, they'll do something to you negatively, and that's not true. You know, one of the things I found, Jermaine, in the many years I lived on the coast, and I used to live in Makaha and in Waianae proper, it really doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It really doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. It's a place where people respond to you based on your heart. So regardless, even, even if you're a native Hawaiian and you're out there in a Hawaiian community, you act a certain way, you're going to get treated a certain way. Yes. But if you're not a native Hawaiian and you act from the heart, I think people pick up on that a lot. Well, three of my grand, two, uh, grandparents are native Hawaiian, 100%. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of my tutus are actually 100% German. And so I'm German Hawaiian descent. And my grandfather, who's German, was actually an engineer for the railroad. And he was the engineer for the railroad going around the island. Well, you know, the Waianae Coast is such a remarkable place. While we said earlier, it, it is the most native Hawaiian population, the most densely populated place on the planet, it's also tremendously integrated with other racial backgrounds. It's almost as if most of us Hawaiians out there are mostly something else, too. Yes. So you're proud of your German heritage. I am. I'm not going to separate myself, defragment myself because of my German heritage. I love my tutu. He, his garden was filled. It was like a Garden of Eden. Every fruit that I could think of, things like even um, star fruit. You know, he had ivy and olives and, of course, lots of different varieties of mango trees. He had, he said if they could not provide food for your body or for your um, healing, like medicinal, la'au, la la'pa'au, then they didn't belong in his garden. So he had all kinds of stuff um, when I was growing up. And that's what fond memories that I have of my kids. Sure. You know, one of the misconceptions about the Waianae Coast and about the Hawaiian people in general is that we all have the same political leaning, that, that we're all fighting for our independence and separation from the United States of America. Number two, from the series Finding Respect in the Chaos, it's called Changing Our Approach to Gender-Based Violence, hosted by Cynthia Lee Sinclair with guest Chelsea Stewart of the Domestic Violence Action Center at UH Manoa. It's on our Finding Respect in the Chaos playlist. Domestic violence, or DV for short, it's, it's a very broad definition because there's different types of abuse. There, uh, most people assume domestic violence to be just physical, um, mm -hmm. like one person beating their partner, their intimate partner. Right. Um, but there's actually a lot more to that uh, that a lot of people aren't aware about. There, uh, domestic violence can be emotional, 
psychological, um, sexual, and even financial abuse as well. Um, Domestic Violence Action Center, the agency I work for, actually began in 1990. Um, our original name was the Clearing House, um, but we we started out as an organization with two people, and now we have a staff of over 50. Wow! And it was Nancy yes. Kriegman, right? Is, yes. is that who started it? Yes, That's our founder, yeah, right? Nancy Kriegman. Yes. Nice. Do you have any statistics for us of what kind of statistics we're looking at here in Hawaii? Or so it's, it's very America? difficult to, uh, to get statistics, mainly because a lot of times domestic violence is underreported. Right. Um, what I can say, I can only get uh, statistics off of the national database. Um, the general statistics that we always use is in a person's lifetime, one out of three women and one out of every four men will experience domestic violence on, on some level. In Hawaii, what we do know is that um, the rates are a lot higher for Asian and, and the, for the Asian and Pacific Island communities. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Those are some staggering statistics. That's... They are. They are. Okay, so tell us what kind of stuff you guys do at, at DVAC. Is that what you call it, DVAC, instead yeah. of Domestic Violence Action Center? Yeah, it's, it's kind of um, a mouthful. So DVAC for short is okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, what kind of stuff do you guys do? What kind of programs do you have? What, kind, you know, what do you guys do with that? Um, we have a lot of advocacy programs, and um, our main goal is to educate and, and intervene. Um, we have a legal team where we have a group of attorneys that specialize in like deep, what we call a DV law, so uh, family law, family court, for example. Right. So we have attorneys that um, represent clients in their TRO cases, paternity, divorce, and post-decree cases. We also have various types of advocacy divisions. Um, we have actually an advocacy group that spe specializes in um, like parenting, so they help oh, yeah. domestic violence victims and survivors uh, bridge the gap, you know, between them and with their kids. Right, because um, it's so important that we get these kids taught at an early age yes. to be respectful yes, instead of definitely. waiting until after the fact yeah. and then trying to retrain them. Right? Let's teach them right the first time, right? Exactly, <laughs> and that's our that's our goal is to help the family, help the families in general, right. especially the survivors. We connect with their children. Um, we also have a, we also have a, a support group called Hawaii Kaika. Um, it's a nine month, three phase program. Number three, from the series Out of the Comfort Zone, it's called Texting to Save Lives, hosted by R.B. Kelly with Katie Kopesky, Volunteer Crisis Counselor. It's on the Out of the Comfort Zone playlist. The Crisis Tech Line is collecting data. What kind of data are they collecting and why? Yeah, so basically think about every conversation that we're having. It's 40, about 40 messages interchanged. That's all usable, interesting data that we can give back to the public. So I can tell you things like 75% of our texters are under the age of 25. I can tell you that only 58% of them identify as straight can tell you that our top issues are depression, anxiety, self-harm. So that's nationwide. That's interesting information for us to know, kind of as a big snapshot. But for Hawaii, we over-index in issues surrounding the military, mm -hmm. issues like physical abuse. So that's really interesting for local policymakers, for administrators. We can look specifically at Hawaii data and let's say I was a principal and I was concerned about eating disorders in my school. So I can look specifically at that topic and I can see that Sundays is the day that people text in most about eating disorders. And I can say, huh, well, I'm going to have a school assembly on Fridays about eating disorders and let's see if that changes or drops off. So this is meant to be actionable data for people to try to curb these icky things that are happening state and nationwide. And it's not like you're compiling data to say, oh, Mary from third period has no, an eating disorder. Perfect. No, it's just uh, from this age group, this percent of people seem to be struggling with eating disorders. So yeah. here's a way you can use the data and actually help people. Absolutely. Yes. So we don't, you're absolutely right. So we're looking at, if you want to get technical, we're looking at aggregate data, right? So it's stripped down of any of that uh, personally identifiable information. 
And just to further clarify that, so when I get a text message, it's like anonymous 235, da, 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 da. so I never see anybody's name or where they're from or anything like that. Um, and so all the data is just really percentages that people can look at at crisistrends.org. So that's separate um, from Crisis Text Line, which is where we're talking about our service. But crisistrends.org is where people can get access to that data. Interesting. Yes. Can you tell me anything else about the trends here in Hawaii? Um, we've had 5,000 texters since we've launched. And like I said, we have 33 um, active crisis counselors. Um, that's about all I really know, to be honest with you, RV. <laughs> <laughs>
including I remember when I was um, when I was recovering from my double knee surgery. You had me in the hallway with bands around my feet, right. running up and down the hallway and, and doing all that stuff, sweating. <laughs> make you sweat, yeah. And you had that smile on your face. Love that it. Smi- you loved it. You <laughs> loved it. I know you were going to get out there sooner than you're supposed to, so. Yeah, yeah. and I did, thanks yes. to you. So tell me a little bit about your theory. Your theory is that if a patient comes in to see you, do you, do you do what the orthopedic surgeon says, or do you have your own protocol? Well, of course, we follow the general protocol of their surgery because, you know, they have pretty general guidelines. Like at w- one month, you're supposed to be doing this, two months. But, of course, I pushed you because I knew you could handle it, but within safe guidelines. So first, you need to get full range of motion, right? So some people just have you stretch. But, of course, I do a lot of manual because if I don't do that, it's going to take a lot longer. So we do a lot of massage, fascial stretching, fascial release, stuff like that. Push a lot of the swelling out because a lot of times you don't have full range of motion because there's so much swelling in the joint. So that's your biggest factor. And once that's all gone, then strengthen you within your protocol. So can people come to East Oahu, East Oahu Physical Therapy by themselves or must they be referred? If they come by themselves, they have to pay cash. If they come with a referral, then their insurance covers pretty much 90% of it. Uh, we're showing the back of my leg where I tore my hamstring, which was completely full of swelling and edema. Chris, how did you treat this? Well, one of the biggest ideologies that uh, I've kind of uncovered while I've been helping people with muscular injuries is that human beings are machines, but we are a little bit more like a web. We also have a staff pick. This time it's from the series Hispanic Hawaii and it's called Staff Domestic Violence Awareness hosted by Richard Concepcion with guest Chirito Rivera. It's on our Hispanic Hawaii playlist. Uh, The long term effect whether there's a child or not. I mean for, for us as an adult you get into a relationship at 20 years old and that's the only type of relationship you know. You're gonna carry it on to your 30s and 40s and 50s if you don't do something about it. So, and the worst part is it could turn deadly. And we're going to talk about that, the cycle of abuse. Okay. Because, like I mentioned, it it could turn deadly. If if it doesn't get, you don't get help right away, it could just escalate. And if we could look at that uh, picture there. So, as you can see, in the beginning of a relationship, we all go through that honeymoon period. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> everything is good, you know, and then we learn more about the person, things we don't like about the person. In a healthy relationship, we're able to communicate and say, you know, I noticed you did this, and, you know, I'm, can we talk about it? Maybe, you know, and talk and compromise on something. And then there's apologies and promises going to happen again, and it won't happen again in a, in a healthy relationship. In an unhealthy relationship, abusive relationship, however, there's a promise that maybe there's no more alcohol in the house or there's no more drugs, but that promise gets broken. And then tensions build up. And then it explodes because the other person just keeps saying, hey, you, you promise you're not going to do this anymore. And the other person's like, well, who are you to tell me? I'm an adult. And then the explosion happens. And then there's uh, apologies again, like I'm not going to do it anymore. or Sometimes the perpetrator even says, well, you made me drink or you made me do it. Statistically, it takes about seven times for the victim to actually leave the abusive relationship. Seven times. Seven times going through the cycle. Yes. And I'm, and I'm talking about also leaving the relationship, not just getting out of that cycle. Because they may think that they're getting out of the cycle by, you know what, I'm going to speak up for myself. but for the sake of the kids, they stay. So how can you prevent this? Good question. <laughs> it, I would say it starts with us, ourselves. So if you are in an abusive relationship, how do you prevent it? You can always find the links to these shows in our daily email advisories. 
If you don't get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on our homepage on thinktechhawaii.com. These were only samplings from the top five in the staff pick from across our 30 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community, great content at ThinkTech. If you have any questions or comments about these or our other shows, please let us know. And yes, it's okay to share them with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for watching our shows and for supporting our efforts to raise public awareness. And now, let's check out our ThinkTech scheduled events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. And now, here's this week's ThinkTech commentary. Hawaii took the long route to increasing consumer choice at the airport, but finally we've arrived there, or at least we're getting there. After a lengthy negotiation, the state has granted Uber and Lyft permission to pick up passengers from two designated areas at Inouye International Airport. Now, for travelers frustrated by long lines and lack of options, the absence of the two popular ride-sharing companies was very confusing. Why limit a transportation option at a major vacation destination when other airports are doing it all the time? Well, the answer comes down to regulation. Because taxi companies in Hawaii are heavily regulated, they protested, and probably rightly so, the fact that Uber and Lyft were not forced to compete on the same playing field. The best solution from a free market perspective would be to re-examine and ease the regulatory burden on cab companies as well. But the state went a different route, often to spread red tape around a bit more. So like taxi drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers will have to pay for the privilege of picking up airport passengers. The pilot program requires the rideshare drivers to pay 7% of each fare to the Department of Transportation, the airport's division. But rideshare drivers are still not allowed to solicit customers, and they cannot wait at the airport. Uh, they're limited to prearranged pickups only. Uber estimates that a ride from the airport to downtown will cost about $17, to Waikiki about $24, and to Kapolei it'll run about $36. 
Well, more competition does mean that customers should benefit from shorter waits at the airport. And while this is a trial program for now, if things go well, the temporary three-month permit could become permanent. It's at least an important first step toward increasing consumer choice, along with creating new jobs and opportunities in Hawaii. However, we shouldn't forget the fact that the state regulations slowed the availability of ride-sharing in the first place. And the reality is this. If Hawaii wants to remain economically competitive, we should be looking for ways to decrease state involvement in the market, both for cabs and for ride-share vehicles, and not weigh everyone down equally. But that's probably good enough for now. I'm Kaylee Akina, wishing you aloha. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. The Atherton Family Foundation, Castle and Cook, Hawaii. The Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Collateral Analytics. The Cook Foundation. The Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners. Hawaii Energy. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. The Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Hawaiian Electric Companies. The High Tech Development Corporation. Galen Ho of BAE Systems. Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Dwayne Carisu, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of Think Tech, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sidney Stern Memorial Trust, the Volo Foundation, Eurico J. Sugimura. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation, wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Nicole Horry. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.